Welcome everyone to another edition of Expat Hoops, where we talk to basketball players who have played their pro careers outside of the U.S. Today we talk to Marin Crocker, a former Horizon League Player of the Year at Wisconsin Green Bay and a WNBA draftee who started her career overseas in Spain. Just a reminder that we rely on listener support. Subscribing to our YouTube channel and liking the videos have a big impact. For our audio podcast listeners, it's pretty similar. Follow and review us wherever you get your podcasts, like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I think we're even on Facebook now, uh, podcasts. But enough oh, that, about that us. That website. Yeah, uh, but enough about us. Let's talk to Marin. Uh, <laughs> she joins us today from Sweden. Uh, welcome to the pod, Marin. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as we mentioned off the top, you're a Horizon League Player of the Year uh, 2017 played in three NCAA tournaments, quite an accomplished college career. Um, but we like to usually pick up, you know, in the period of time in your college career, when you actually start thinking, all right, this professional thing, I'm going to kind of do that. What did that look like for you? Uh, we always struggle with how to ask this question because I'm sure there's probably some level of wanting to play professionally, but when did it really kind of start hitting home for you that, yeah, I can do this. Or did somebody approach you or what was it like? And, um, I'm sure probably WNBA was discussed uh, with you as a Horizon League Player of the Year, but what did that all look like for you taking that process in? I was an extremely late bloomer. Um, I got to college my first year. I put on the freshman 15, probably maybe a couple more, if we're being honest, Um, tore my ACL. My body couldn't handle the pounding and ended up redshirting that first year. then it was kind of a year of working myself back and then finally figuring out what my role on the team would be. Um, I probably had a good final year. So it probably took me up until my senior year to be a high impact player on the team. And I was lucky enough. Um, you kind of look back on your career and you see a couple things happening to kind of align. And it sounds really terrible, but we had one of the best players on our team transfer. <laughs> and I kind of filled that role. And then there's a couple other things that happened that kind of put me into a starring role my senior year, my fifth year. Um, so you almost want to thank her for leaving, although I, you know, we were good friends and she wanted to go elsewhere, but that kind of thrust me into the spotlight. Um, and I, I found a, I had a big developmental year going into my senior year in the summer. Um, and I don't know if playing overseas was ever in my mind, to be honest. Um, I think you know, this is kind of going to date me as well, but growing up and uh, I wasn't surrounded by a ton of high level women's athletes. I I mean, I was surrounded by a high level like male athletes, but I didn't really know of people playing overseas. When I had gotten to Green Bay, a couple of my older teammates had gone, but I don't think you really like have that concept of what it is until it affects you directly. You know, I, I kind of use this metaphor or analogy of when I tore my ACL, you don't realize how many people do or the length that comes how long it takes you to come back or the physical grueling like taxing journey it is until it happens to you and all of a sudden you're realizing that oh I can extend my career but up until that point I I don't think it's even in the back of my head you know social media is not that big you know my friends when I'm in high school early on you're not posting I think Facebook maybe Instagram was just starting to become a thing Um, so I don't think it was as easily accessible to see what that life over here was like Um, Fast forward probably halfway into my senior year, I realized I was having a decent year and had the idea of working with an agent and exploring overseas options kind of come into my brain via, you know, coaches and old teammates. Um, And I don't think the idea of going pro was a thing until like right before our conference tournament uh, with the WNBA. I kind of lucked out. I don't know it's kind of like right place at the right time, I like to say, but um, the head coach of the Washington Mystics, um, Mike Tebow, was our announcer, our color commentator for our Horizon League tournament my senior year, Mm. and for our NCAA tournament. So through that, I got to know him a little bit based on interviews and, you know, talking off camera and stuff like that. Um, So I feel like I got lucky in the process and happened to play a couple of good games in the process. I, I think I got pretty lucky because he did our Horizon League color commentating, and then he ended up doing our NCAA tournament game down in South Bend, Indiana against Purdue. 
um, at Notre Dame. So throughout getting to know him and talking with him and being interviewed, we kind of struck up a friend, not friendship. That sounds incredibly stupid. Um, a, I don't know, business. We just got to know each other a little bit. And, um, I think I probably gained some ethos through that. And he ended up drafting me, which was pretty cool. But, um, I think a couple, I got lucky along the way and then happened to have some good games in the process. Well, Tony, I was going to say, uh, this is the point where I think you've talked on the podcast before about, uh, you know, just like a regular job. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's about who, you know, that's right. Yep. Networking, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you don't necessarily have a physical resume like those of us who are desk jockeys have, but you well, I a, do actually, well, I mean, I took, did you know, I took it last year off? I did. I did. Yeah, I'm so the re- I, I, have, I'm the I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, yeah. and say, I've seen, have, I've seen a lot of the, my- I've seen a lot of the professional players that actually do have resumes like uh, Larry Thomas, like who did a lot of things on his own. He's got a resume and like basically a website and a resume are, are like, that makes me a little bit sad where I'm like, Oh, athletes are doing some of the same things that we do. <laughs> oh Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're not exempt from that aspect um, of it, but unfortunately, I took, I actually took last year off. I was signed to go back to Spain. I had my contract signed and it came what well, it was summer of 2020 and it was about July. And I thought I can't get on this plane and go back. And so it ended up being wonderful timing of I, well, I had to pay to get out of my contract, which was awful, but uh, an assistant coaching job opened up at my alma mater, Green Bay. And so I applied for that and I ended up just coaching last year. Yeah, that was actually, so I'm, I'm the one, if anybody that's listening, uh, our three listeners uh, will be interested to know that, um, (laughs) that I'm usually the one that reaches out. And that's one of the things that I was, I, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of times I like to talk. I like to get into people's different backgrounds that are all invariably somewhat unique. Um, But yours is definitely one that, I found particularly fascinating too. Um, not only the fact that you have ties to some of the other people that we've interviewed from the Wisconsin Glow, perhaps mm-hmm. you know, let's say the the Pod's unofficial favorite team uh, in there that particular we'll league. That. <laughs> um, so, so there's there's definitely the connections to some of our other friends of the Pod, uh, so to speak, who are great people uh, that we've enjoyed talking to them. But also, your story is really unique that you've played in Spain, a uh, great league. Um, mm-hmm. for for women's overseas you took the year off said I'm not done so there was kind of this you've got this really interesting experience so that's getting a little bit ahead but yeah uh, and we'll explore all that like kind of okay. in turn but I don't know I, I I when I say I like talking to some of our guests and everything like that and everything like that it's it's exactly sort of like these unique stories um that I think kind of like makes what we do um and it's not because we get to do it we just get to bring it out so mm-hmm. um but before you get into some of the top leagues in Spain um and you know the WNBA experience and everything like that um you kind of talked a little bit about really towards your conference tournament and that's really kind of when it started to become more real for you what was the process like of finding an agent I think you kind of talked I'm paraphrasing here that you didn't necessarily know a lot of people that at least on the women's side that had, had done what you're currently doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that that's probably the first time you've ever even thought about hiring an agent. Was it something that you went to your coaches for experience on, or was it something that you had agents that approached you and you just kind of did it on your own? Like what was your experience like in saying, okay, this is the, the person that I'm going to go with and, mm-hmm. and why? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that for how much info is out there, that there's hardly any info to be had at at the collegiate level. I don't want to say that because I don't want this to be a reflection on the Green Bay coaches or anything, but it's amazing that when it comes time to kind of let the, let the, let your players go and out into the real world, not that it's a, we're done with you, but it's kind of like, we have so much to focus on here. I don't have a lot of knowledge here. um, But here's what I know and take it. You know, and so for me, it was, they had a couple really good recommendations. I talked with a couple and I signed with one immediately. Um, I thought I wanted to be represented. I went to the pro hoops combine after my season was ended. And uh, I thought I wanted to be represented there so that when coaches had the opportunity to watch me play, my agent could kind of be, and here's Marin, 
you know, and kind of guide them towards me or kind of uh, focus their attention towards me. And I thought maybe that would give me an advantage as opposed to some of the other players that weren't signed at that point. Um, so I didn't have a ton of knowledge going in. Um, to get onto a side note here, there's a company that's being formed right now called Weevolve by a bunch of overseas athletes. One of them plays on the GLOW team. Um, and it's basically like an information database for girls going to college, wanting to play overseas from girls overseas that want to play in college. And basically it's just an information network that now I serve as a mentor on those so that girls, when they're looking to play overseas and it's just one snippet of what they offer, but like they can call me and say, what are your, what is, what are your opinions on these agents? What's your opinion on these clubs? Because there's such a lack of information present within the U S about what's going on overseas. Um, and I think that that's a huge disadvantage for us on the women's side, especially. And it, when you go over there, your Americans and your imports, regardless if they're on your team or not, are like huge, 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 and so crucial to putting you in a good spot, in a safe spot with a good agent, which with one that's not just pipelining you to the same team. Um, and so now I wish I could have looked back and do that. I ended up leaving my agent, um, not because of anything other than I thought I found someone that, or I thought I found someone that can serve me and my needs better. Um, but those are things that when you're over there and you start to talk to people, this is my agent, this is my agent, go to this club, don't go to this club. Like the information over here is so crucial. And that's why I'm really happy that this Weevolve is starting because it's information that's so necessary for these girls graduating and starting their next step, you know? Absolutely. And there's a million and one different ways I could go with this and we'll probably have to do yeah. this portion off the pod where there's some things I want to talk to you about further. I know that sounds cryptic, but it's not that bad. No, you're good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's certainly, I mean, you hit on several of the things that are a lot more common of experiences that I think before we started doing this, we appreciated and certainly maybe people that listen to this uh, podcast are now familiar with the concept of, agents are kind of temporary and that some of them mm -hmm. are better with certain countries than others or, or mm -hmm. you know unfortunately sometimes you may, might have a bad experience but sometimes it's just a matter of just not the right fit and it's okay mm -hmm. to move on um so that's you certainly hit a lot of the the common themes that might happen um but you at that point in time was your agent somebody that kind of had experience with WNBA overseas or both? Um, both. And he at the time, well, I shouldn't say at the time, but he um, works with a lot, a lot, a lot of really good talent. But it's also one that works with a ton of people in general. And so you kind of realize that like, I, I believe I'm a good basketball player. You know, I have confidence in myself. I am not a WNBA superstar and I am not the 1% over in Europe, you know? And so I have to realize that when I'm working with an agent, where do I fall on, you know, kind of their to-do list? Like, where do I rank on their roster? You know, am I a player that they're contacting every day? Am I a player that if I text them, am I going to get a response? Am I a player that I know they're working for another job for me? Or am I being pipelined into a team that they already have? You know, the longer you're overseas, you think like you see teams and you're like, ah, that agent has six players on that same team, not because they're a good fit, but because I know I can place a player there and it's safe and easy and guaranteed money. And that's not a knock at the agents. It's just the reality of what's happening over here, you know? Absolutely. And so I, I think it's more like, I, I have nothing bad to say about my former agents, um, but I just found someone that right now I, I can communicate with every day. I feel very comfortable going to her. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's, I don't know if it's a, a woman thing because I feel like with women, we're more, in, not to get this on this subject, but like we're more inclined to say sorry. And I think sometimes we forget that they work for us. Like we pay them to do what we ask. We shouldn't feel guilty going to them with questions. We shouldn't feel guilty going them with, to this is what I want and this is where I want to play. Um, and with her, I don't feel, not that I'm a high maintenance player, but I don't feel, you know, intimidated or nervous, or I don't feel like I'm an annoyance to her. 
by the way, you can get on that subject on this podcast. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> we might be yeah. two dudes that host this podcast, but uh, we've we've interviewed a lot of people. So that's the reality yeah, I mean, that you, you have know, to go oh, through. Yeah, you know how women are. We're more inclined to apologize. We're more inclined to go, oh, sorry to disturb. And it's like, oh, what the hell? I'm paying you. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not a disturbance. Yeah, I'm this is a professional you. relationship. They're taking yeah. a cut of your salary. Yeah, yeah They have certain be, duties and responsibilities. Yeah. I yeah, shouldn't be exactly. scared to ask you, hey, I'm not exactly. being paid on time. Like that should be a non-negotiable that I should be. <laughs> yeah. And that is such a common refrain from anyone, men and women that they talk about, not necessarily the relationship with the agent, but the fact that they're not getting paid on time. That is just yeah. so often happens. Now, only now, in the I, very upper, upper parts of Europe and other leagues do you find yeah. that you actually get paid on time. You know, I've lucky enough. Now I use that as an example and maybe that's wrong of me, but I've never been in that position in my four years. I think I've, Oh man, I think you asked some of my teammates and friends, and I think you could ask probably everyone and they've got some like horror story of an overseas experience, whether it be a coach, a team, a city, whatever it might be. I have been extremely lucky and I feel like I should knock on wood at this point, but I've never been in a situation where I felt unsafe. I've never been in a situation where I felt like it wasn't professional. I've never been in a situation where I haven't been paid on time. I understand that that is an anomaly and I'm in the minority on that. And you are, you're, yeah. Yeah. So not only that, and it's not to say that it couldn't happen in some of the countries that you've played in, but the countries that you've played in so far are kind of known for being good. Um, yeah. So that that also probably does factor in. Like I said, I'm not saying that every club in Spain no, is, you're right. is above reproach, but at the same time, you, for the most part, your percentages are going to be a lot yep. better in Spain or your percentages are going to be a lot better in mm-hmm. Sweden. So that's, Absolutely. you know, you've gotten yeah. lucky not only in terms of your clubs, but also the countries, I guess, as well, which I don't, I don't really want to say lucky because obviously you've no, played your, I know played your way into I, that. Yeah. I haven't chosen those clubs intentionally by any means or the countries. It's just worked out really well in that fact, in that way. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying completely. I did want to circle back and get you to talk on the pod just a little bit, because we have been talking about overseas. That's what we do here. Mm-hmm. But your story of getting drafting with the mystics is really interesting. Um, before we get into more of the overseas stuff, talk to us about your experience of getting drafted into the WNBA, because you, you talked about your housing situation. Um, Mm -hmm. you didn't play very long there. Uh, Mm And so I'm curious, in addition to that, did you have realistic expectations when you got drafted in the WNBA, how long you would be there, how it would work, things like that? Um, no, (laughs) no, (laughs) That's a short answer. Um, to me, it was kind of like a baptism by fire, Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you may. Um, I mean, I worked as soon as I got drafted, I had no idea if I was going to be drafted. I had been told by two teams, um, that it was a strong possibility. So when that, when my name came across that screen, it was a complete surprise. You know, it, it was really cool. We had a little watch party in our locker room with our coaches and our team my parents were there and then we had a little celebration after at a local grill bar and grill that was a sponsor of ours and like the community could come and say congrats and then it got time to work I think I had a week or two to prepare before I went out there and I went out there without having graduated which I think is interesting for a lot of people to find out too that most people report before you've actually graduated college um and so I went out there and I I remember submitting my master's thesis (laughs) <laughs> from like a Starbucks in DC and being like, oh, cool, I'm done, but I'm still here playing. You know, it was kind of anticlimactic. But um, yeah, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know how long I was going to be out there. Um, turns out that my experience was very typical of most draftees and rookies where you're out there, you might have a couple good days, you get your ass kicked a ton. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I oh, yes, it was you are allowed to say that. We'll get into that later too, but go ahead. Yeah, it was um it's hard when you take a mid-major style of basketball and throw it immediately into the pro style. And that would be one of my biggest knocks on our way we played is that I was a phenomenal team player. I could move without the ball. We played a five out offense where I was able to post drive shoot and then I got to the pro style which is all ball screen driven um and I'm a player that had not really came off any ball screens in college and we had two posts in the lane so why would I be posting (laughs) you know so I feel like that took out 60 percent of my scoring and my offensive threat um and me as an offensive threat and then 
pair that with me not being comfortable in a ball screen situation. And I kind of wrote my, that kind of sealed my fate right there. Um, but then the more you talk to people, you think like, this is, this is typical. You know, I, I brought something that I believe was unique. Um, and I don't think the team needed it at that point. Fast forward three or four years, I feel very comfortable saying I was not ready, nor was I prepared. Um, and that's, that's the reality of the situation. I don't think I fully understood what I was stepping into until I was there. And my college coach always had a, a saying to the seniors when the freshmen came in of like, show them why they're not ready yet. And that could not have held more true for me during the training camp. Um, I don't think it was a bad decision that they cut me. Um, it was a wonderful wake up call that hurt a lot because I don't think anyone likes to be fired or waived or whatever it might be. Um, but it was one of those get back in the gym and I knew exactly what I needed to do to get better. And as a result, we spent the entire summer after I'd been waived working on ball screen stuff, working on my deficiencies. You know, I was able to walk away from training camp with a, here's four things you absolutely need at the, um, pro level. And when I walked into the Spain preseason, I feel like I was a little bit more ready. So ended up working out nicely because I never got fired overseas, <laughs> but yeah. And, and so let's, let's get into that first stint that you had in Spain, which was at yep. this point in, uh, uh, was that 2017, 2018 that you were there or was it a little bit later? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And so that was a uh, Cadi Lasso. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Cadi Lasso. Yeah. Sao. Okay. Yeah, uh, and so you were over there. That was the start of your career. Spain's a pretty high level league uh, in women's yep. basketball um, and men's basketball. I well, think men's basketball, it's like the the maybe one of, if not the best. Uh, it's pro it's the next. Of the NBA. The, it's like consistently the second best league yeah. by country. Your league combined is is going to mm -hmm. be the second best outside of the NBA. But as far as like singular country, yeah, I think Spain is at least for yeah. the men is usually going to be the top. And, and they're women their yep. women's league is ultra competitive, but as you see for overseas, the leagues that are most competitive are not where the Americans go. Like sure. Every league, their top teams are going to have two or three WNBA players, maybe more, but it's the national players that make the difference in the leagues and Absolutely. Spain pays their players to stay home. And I have a ton of respect for the Spanish league because of that. But like, that's why that league is so good. And arguably them in France might be the two most complete, competitive leagues in Europe um but they pay their players to stay home and so like it's it's a no-brainer why they stay like if I was paid to stay home I'd stay too and but, so you um, felt you felt like your experience in Spain was pretty beneficial to you career-wise what was that like yeah I mean I feel like having Spain on my resume is a huge 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 plus um it's a very difficult league it doesn't necessarily highlight Americans I think that's a big misconception I think when you see both on the men's and women's side you play about 20 25 maybe high 20 minutes um statistics are generally down but it's a fun way to play it's a fast-paced game um I learned a ton being over there you know I just I had a really really great coach my first two years who really, really helped me develop at the European level because European basketball is much different than the States, especially Spain. Spain plays a very unique style of basketball and he was willing to work with me extra. And we had a couple of younger players on the team that he would really like pour into. Um, so I think that that transition was made easier because of him as well. And we had some great veterans on the team. Like the men, the Spanish league is a veteran dominated league. Um, and we had a lot of older girls and older women on our team that were really great to work with. Were there any culture shock moments that you had there off the court? Um, yeah, I mean, it was a great time for me to be there because the first question was what's going on with Trump. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like hands down. The first question I was asked as an American over there. Um, wow. cause that was going on as I got over there. Yeah, um, that's true. Actually. It's easy to forget. Spain, yeah, in Spain at the moment when I was there, the whole Catalan and Spanish, um, what do you want to say? It's like a hundred year issue that's been going on since the mm -hmm. start of whatever, but that was kind of coming to an head ahead. And so being in the Catalan region was an eye opener of they were fighting for equal taxation and their leaders were being put in the Spanish jails and this uh, Catalan president had fled the country at that time. And so mm -hmm. there was a lot of like, 
angst within the country that was going on that I had no idea about because we don't hear about that stuff in America. Three years in Spain. So Mm -hmm. you spent a good while there. Um, Mm -hmm. You were on two different teams. Uh, Mm -hmm. What was your contract situation like between your initial contract when you got into the league versus when you left? Um, There was a little bit more money. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think that's probably- I know that's not always the case, but- Thank God. No. Uh, Yeah, it was a little bit more money. Um, I wouldn't say that there was too many like clauses that were different. It was pretty standard from one to another. Um, I'm trying to think of any big differences. Some of it had playoff bonuses. Some did not. Some of them had performance bonuses. Some of them did not. Um, I was always on a one-year contract. Um, Yeah, I think that was probably just your standard. I had nothing crazy in my contracts that probably is worth speaking about. <laughs> nothing, nothing incredibly like a, a fringe benefit or anything like that. Nope. <laughs> There's a couple nice perks. Like my third year in Spain, um, I was in San Sebastian, which is a oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh my goodness. One of my favorite cities I've been to um, and was fortunate enough to live there, but we were sponsored by a spa. So that was really nice. So we had like those benefits that we could go daily and it was right on the beach overlooking the water. Tough, tough place to be. Um, Why did you uh, leave? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) seriously. Uh, Uh, Did did you uh, frequent any of the pinch dust that uh, are in uh, San Sebastian and things like that? Did you have any of the cider? Yeah, we did a lot of pinchos and then tapas was a big thing as well. But um, I might be... uh, draw some fire for saying this but i i don't miss the spanish cuisine hmm. i mean it's i don't think it's they're known for their cuisine necessarily for, besides well for, first and foremost i think in spain there are many cuisines so like it's all say, regional, regional yeah. is probably if you're, yeah. if you're on the mediterranean coast versus san sebastian you're in two completely different types Correct. of cuisine. i will say that like on the galician coast the seafood was oh yeah unpar like it was yeah. amazing yeah but sure. i would say that they're like actual cuisine i don't think it's defined by anything you're right i don't necessarily miss that yeah that's the you were in more in basque country which is yes. a little bit different um style of stuff so hey mm-hmm. uh, teach their own yeah. everybody um yeah. everybody has differences uh in terms of their opinion of things so that's perfectly fine um mm-hmm. now we got to go into the uh moment that was the genesis of the podcast which was the COVID-19 pandemic uh you yeah. of course started the professional career before that which means you have a COVID story um mm-hmm. most yes. if not all of our guests so far have had some sort of COVID story some sort of delay some sort of shutdown what was that like for you where were you and what were you doing Ooh. well first off I think COVID hit our team December January so you heard of a lot of people overseas kind of contracting it prior to hitting the U.S. Something that's not funny is that my parents came and visited, I believe in January, and my dad got sick upon arriving home, and we kind of call him like patient zero. (laughs) I was going to say that. I was going to make that joke too. Yeah, but um, everything's okay. He's okay. Obviously, the pandemic was super scary. Don't like to make that joke. Publicly, that was much more it, scary then too than it is now. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. When you, back then, yeah. COVID nineteen, it was, a lot of people were like, "How's this going to go?" You didn't know mm-hmm. what was exactly was going to happen. You had to monitor yourself closely. There was no vaccine, so there was no mm-hmm. treatment. It was everything was up in the air. So, yeah, well, yeah. Sure. I had a couple teammates hospitalized during that time, and they had no idea what was going on. And now looking back, a lot of like their blood samples have been like run again in those hospitals, and a lot of them have had COVID nineteen. I think I had it. Um, I think in my however many years of playing, I've missed one practice due to illness and it was that week. And my coach literally looked at me and said, go home. They said I was like white. Well, Mm -hmm. I am white, like gray. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But it was it was terrible. Um, The week I I remember specifically the week we got shut down, it was kind of like rumblings of something's happening, like let's say Monday by Wednesday, it was, we're playing and it's going to be closed door. No, no, um, audience or crowd by Friday, we were shut down and I was a play. I was on the plane on Saturday. Hmm. Um, I was pulled over taking my apartment to, or my roommate to the airport. She flew out the night before I did. I was pulled over because we weren't allowed to, we weren't supposed to be out. Um, 
Ange, I don't know if you talked to Angela Rodriguez yep. about her story. Hers was horrific. And I got out before she did, which was really, really lucky. Um, but it, it kind of makes me laugh about us in the States complaining about, you know, <laughs> being controlled by the government. And it's so horrific that we're detained and shut into our houses. And it was like in Europe, it was awful. People were being ticketed. People, you weren't allowed to walk outside at all. Like it was much more strict strict over here and I I got home and I was like oh I can still walk outside no big deal I can still go to the grocery store no big deal you know um but I feel like I got a, just a small sliver of it compared to most people like I got out my agent did a wonderful job getting me out right away I was home so I don't have any like crazy crazy stories except for the league went from functioning on Wednesday to I'm on a plane on Saturday so there was no messing around getting me home so yeah. covid is actually kind of an ongoing or was an ongoing thing for you um, in terms of the story kind of makes it a little bit unique. Um, we talked a little bit off the pod that you were, you'd signed a contract to go back to Spain, um, but you have a really ne- unique experience. Although you're playing again now, you actually stopped for a period of time and started entering the college coaching profession. Um, yeah. What was that decision like for you? And um, you know, uh, at what point, I guess, was it that you realized that you kind of missed playing? Yeah, I abruptly retired. (laughs) Um, I said my goodbye, you know, even posted that Instagram. This has been a wonderful, crazy ride. You know, uh, the timing of it was awesome because a assistant coaching position had just opened up at Green Bay, my alma mater, and um, I applied and ended up getting that job. So it seemed like a no brainer, super easy to just kind of transition into college coaching, which I had wanted to do. Um, And obviously being back in a community where I had friends, I had family, you know, it family is close by just an hour and a half down the road. Um, It seemed like a no brainer to me. Um, It was a wonderful experience. I kind of was just thrown in and uh, <laughs> kind of found out what college coaching is at a mid major level. I think our coaching staff did a really great job when I was playing of kind of keeping that curtain, you know, drawn in between us and what actually happens behind the scenes. Um, but I remember sitting July recruiting hit and uh, it's just gotten insane where they put all all these tournaments together and they're back to back to back now. And it's changed so much. The landscape of it has changed so much since I was playing. And um, we were out recruiting for what, three weeks. And then you have unofficial visits sandwiched in between. And we had something like 15 visits. And I remember I finally got up to one of my best friend's cottages, like a lake house. I don't know how much you know about the Midwest, but lake, like lake, weekends are the best part of summers and I got up there from like two o'clock to nine o'clock and that was it because I had to be back the next day for a visit and I thought what am I doing like I I've seen the sun one day out of the month of July like this is awful but even before that I had the glow asked me to play again and I had retired I was like I'm done whatever and they had called and asked if I wanted to play and I said absolutely and so I got it okayed by my boss And when I was recruiting, I wasn't able to travel on the road trips, which was fine. But any home game, it was held at um, where the Mo, is it the Milwaukee Herd? Well, the Wisconsin Herd play, the uh, Bucks G League team. And we play in their facility. And um, they let me play. And the more I started like playing again, the more I was like, oh man, I miss it. And I was like, no, 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 you don't. It's just fun. And then, um, I was like, oh no, I miss it. I miss it. I miss it. And so then when July hit and I was out recruiting and I was like, I'd rather be playing. I hate, and it's like games from seven 30 in the morning till nine 30 at night. And heaven forbid the games are running behind. You're spending 12 hours in the gym. And then I'm getting up at 5. AM to drive to the next city to sit at the, another four day tournament and then driving another, like it was insane. And I thought I would rather be playing. And that's when I kind of realized that like, at some point I'm going to love that. And like the player development side of it, I loved. I love breaking down video, like the scouting side, I loved. Um, I hated the administrative work and I hated recruiting, like being out recruiting. Um, and I know that's 90% of a collegiate job and that statement couldn't come back and haunt me someday, but I wasn't ready to do it at that moment. 
you know, I was still lucky enough to play with our girls during practice because of COVID. We couldn't have practice players because our bubble was so small. We were still being tested three times a week. Um, and so I was able to kind of play and stay in shape, but it would be one of those where I'd pick up a ball whenever I had to play and go 10 for 10 or eight for 10 during practice and be like, ah, so mindset is a thing while shooting. That would have been nice, you know, <laughs> but um, then when I started actually playing games again, um, I remember this is kind of going to be like I'm name dropping here and I don't want it to sound like a flex, but the moment I realized, um, obviously like sitting in the locker room, I broke down after one of the glow games to all my teammates. And I was like, guys, I think I want to go back and play again. But I knew like quitting after a year at the division one level and walking away from the girls, which I adored was going to be really difficult. But, um, they were like, we get it. And we see your emotion and you play with way too much heart out there. Like, it's not like you're showing up to have fun. Like you're actually playing with heart. And that's something that like an, a player who's ready to be done is not doing. And um, one of our girls, Andrew Rodriguez, they actually just did a really cool story about her, but one of her best friends in the world is Wesley Matthews. And he called me, he was at the game and he, we talked after the game and he goes, I will pay you out triple what you're making this summer for you to be done playing with the glow. And I said, no, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. He goes, so you need to keep playing. If money's not it for you, you miss the game and you need to keep playing. And I was like, oh, and it like slapped me across the face and hit me that it was like, you're right. Wow. And he goes, you're, he's he's just like, you need to go back and play again. He's like, you're not done. He kind of just said like, I'm ending the, my career, you know, I'm nearing the end of my career and I'm doing whatever I can to elongate it. But he was like, you walked away too early. And if you're not willing to take me to pay triple what you're making right now, you need, you need to go back and play. And that I didn't realize it because it was a no brainer to me. I was like, no, I'm not taking that money. That's dumb. And he goes, there's your answer. Then you need to go back and play. And so that kind of was like my reality check by someone like that shouldn't have any opinion in the matter, but like watched a game and was like, oh, you, you, no, 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 no. You need to go back and play. Coaching will always be there. So that was kind of my like, welcome to Jesus moment where it was, uh, you know, a reality check. And uh, the following week I ended up going back and you know, resigning or putting my two weeks in at Green Bay and uh, signing the agent immediately. And that's how I wind up, wound up at Osterson. I signed in the middle of August to come on over here. So here's an interesting question for you and not to say anything negative of the league in Sweden, because again, it's, it's a good league, but you'd been in Spain for the first few years, a really high level league uh, had, I don't want to say taken a year off because obviously put in a lot of work, uh, but it was a different kind of work. So it's, it's, you know, mm -hmm. adjacent to what you did, it's still basketball and everything like that. But did you kind of take a step back this year just because you hadn't as silly as that seems and as much as, you know, we know that you could play, we kind of see it a lot of times with, if you don't have something recent, you basically kind of go back. I don't want to say square one, but you go back mm -hmm. a little bit. Was that something that you faced a little bit as you were trying to come back? Yeah. I mean, I was not naive in knowing that me coming back, I was going to have to sacrifice something, right? Like whether it be pay, whether it be league status, whether it be country I wanted to play in, I'm not naive in the fact of walking in thinking like, oh, I can show up and be on a high level Spanish team again. I knew that wasn't going to happen. Um, so it was kind of just like, a, I'm going to take anything that sounds okay at this point. And I know I just need to get my foot in the door. And at this point, I just want to play. And there was, I was not happy a lot in the Spanish league. I think it, you know, it, the third year, it took a toll on my mental health for sure. Um, it, you know, it's an intense league. It's really, really long. You hardly get any time off. You're kind of isolated over there. Um, ooh, I got to plug in. And um you know, it was a cool flex to come home and say, oh, I played in the Spanish league, but in the reality, my numbers were suffering. I wasn't that happy. And I was ready to be, I was ready to walk away from basketball. And now this year, obviously I sacrificed money in league status, but this is the most fun I've ever had playing. My numbers reflect that. Like my body reflects that. I'm not sore after every practice. I recover better. And I believe that that's a mental thing as well. Um, and so it's kind of for fast forward me into the decision now of what is my next step? You know, I've realized that there's an incredible balance between life and basketball that needs to happen while you're overseas and isolated. And in a Swedish country where everyone speaks English and you're able to, you know, connect with your teammates and connect with the community better 
And there's not as, I mean, it's not as an intensive a league and that's not to downplay it. It's still a competitive league, but you know, there's just more life that's able to be had. Um, and so now it's moving forward. Do I want to try to play at that competitive level again and sacrifice happiness? Do I want to be, you know, in Spain, I was never the go-to player here. It was fun to be able to, I, I don't think I ever once put more than 10 shots up in a Spanish league game here. One day I put up 22, not that that's what I'm after because I think one of the things that makes me a great player is that I'm willing to adapt and do whatever. I've never been the go-to scorer necessarily, but do I want to ever question where my shots are going to come from? Like in the Spanish league, if I miss my first three, it was like, when am I going to get my next here? It's like, great. I'll probably get one another possession from now. And if not, that's okay. So it's, and now it's kind of weighing those of like, what am I actually after? And at what point does happiness start to outweigh those other factors? Because happiness at the end of the day, like, I don't think any woman that's not the upper echelon is chasing their bag, as they say, or like chasing that money. So right now, happiness and body preservation is what's going to elongate my career. So So I'm at a bit of crossroads right now. Interesting. So I was actually going to see if I could take you to this past season and what you're talking about with work-life balance uh, what has been your experience off the court? Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of sum it up. I know that, uh, you know, what you see on the internet, you know, so it's on the internet, it must be true. And your numbers might be slightly different, but, um, I think in my research, it's like, you've got like 18 points a game or something like that. So definitely yeah. playing well on the court, well-established, you know, you're doing well, uh, and not to just completely dismiss it, but we kind of can hit that and move on. So what's the off the court, been like for you in Sweden this last year have you had a chance to uh travel I know you mentioned you got to uh you know so kind of like socialize with your teammates what's been the experience off the court for you this last year in Sweden that's made it a really unique stop for you yeah I mean Osterson in general like our team I know a lot of people say it's kind of like a family but truly like it was a wonderful group of girls that we hung out all the time. We were able to get out in the community and do things. Um, I have a couple good friends that are in Sweden. So I spent Christmas with them and their family. And I just felt like I had a family feel like even um, my third year in Spain, I played with a girl that is arguably the best player in the Swedish league. She's a Swede. And um, her and I got to be really good friends and her parents would come to our games even when, you know, she wasn't playing against me. Cause right now we play against each other in the league and my parents came and visited and stayed with her family and we all hung out and like had dinner. And it's just, those are those things that like, I don't think you can place like a price on seeing like a familiar face in the stand or, you know, loving family. Like I view her family like my own and likewise and being able to see her and having friends through her and, you know, our men's team is here and they're really cool. And uh, I I think it's those little things that just make a difference. I don't know if I can exactly give you a specific reason, but it's just the quality of life in Sweden is really good. And I don't think you have many people here that will, that you'll talk to that play in this league that don't like it. It's just a, they're good. It's a good region. The people are really kind and hospitable and yeah, it's really nice. Uh, after resuming your career, what is next for you? Um, it sounds like you're still trying to figure that out, but where do you see yourself, you know, let's say next time, this time next year? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm headed to Australia next week to play in their league. Um, that's kind of, uh, I wanted to go to Australia. I'm back playing and why not? It's not a great league. I think like competition wise, especially because it's their winter one, it's not their, you know, high level summer season. Um, but the money's really good. The club is really competitive and professional and uh, I've never been to Australia. So I'm not get paid to go. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I was voted forward of the year in Sweden um, and I finished second in MVP voting. And so I have some options in Sweden but I also know that those, that's not to brag about it, but that's things on your resume that you can put on. So it's nice to, you know, shoot a high percentage this year, get some accolades and prove that I deserve to be playing overseas basketball still. And that, you know, I'm not washed up or unable to. Um, 
I have no idea what to tell you. I never thought I'd be playing in the Swedish league in general. I never thought I'd be walking away after three years. I never thought I'd be coming back. And so I feel like every time I try to plan out my life or, you know, put definite things that I want to do, uh, <laughs> I kind of decided to do a 180 and not go that direction. So I think I'm truly trying to, I'm not a planner in general. So I'm trying to take it and just pray about it and see where it leads me. And uh, I'm not, nothing's off the table at this point. You know, I think going to Sweden in a league that I said I probably wouldn't play in has kind of opened my eyes that there are other things out there and that I shouldn't necessarily cross things off my list when I don't really have a ton of info on it. And it's kind of a naive reason to cross it off, you know. Marin Crocker, it's been wonderful having you on Expat Hoops today, but as our longtime listeners know, we're not done yet. You can go over, if you're an audio listener, to our YouTube channel. If you're listening on our audio on uh, our YouTube channel, go ahead over into the Expat Extras. We'll be talking, of course, about our usual trash talk story, and we'll be getting into some of the nuances of women's basketball in general and how that differs from the men, as we have in some other podcasts. Well, we've interviewed women previously. Marin, it's been great to have you. Stick around for a bit. Yep. Thanks for having me, guys. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.